God is good. God is so good. Thank you, Lord. Shit. 
You never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, no, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper.
playmaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, who you are, that is who you are, you're the way maker. That is who you are. 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 I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I am held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. Oh, my life, you have been so, so good with every breath. My life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. All my life you have been 
so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty. Great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am. I want to be near, near to your heart, loving the world. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, for who is worthy, none beside thee. God Almighty, the great I shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell for any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great
mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of the name, King of Majesty, there is no power in Pastor, as he brings forth your word to us, Lord, and just minister to him, speak through him, flow through him, Lord, as we continue our time of worship as we hear your word. We thank you so much for who you are in your name. Amen. Father, it's with humble hearts that we, we come to you this morning. Some are weary, some are tired. Um, some are in affliction and others are in maybe need of a job or housing. Whatever it is, Lord, I, I just pray this morning, God, that we would remember that you are sovereign, Lord. And that if you take care of the birds, you're going to take care of us. Lord, we don't have anything to worry about, but we, we worry. You know, we worry about tomorrow, even though you told us not to. I just pray, God, that this morning as we come here and enter into this time, <clears throat> all the sin and the lies that are in our, our hearts, uh, that are in this room, God, that we just dispose of them. Cleanse ourselves, Lord, that we'd um, allow you to cleanse us through the blood of Jesus. Lord, that we would truly be transformed today, God, because we spent time with you, Lord. That's your desire for us. So give us wisdom, Lord, and insight, God. Lord, can we just listen? Just listen to you. Not the voices of others, not my voice, God, but your voice. May that be heard today. We ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we spent the first six, seven weeks of the year, we spent it in a series called Patterns and Habits. And we were looking at things that we need to change. We need to, habits that we need to put into our lives, habits that we need to get out of our lives. And then last week we talked about being refreshed and to start fresh. And what does that really look like? And we talked about God has a rhythm that's not the world's rhythm. And we talked about creation, how the Jewish day starts at evening, right? It starts out with dinner and the family and discussion 
and then you have rest, and then you wake up, and then you go to work. But our rhythm is different. We start the day with work, and then whatever we have left over, that's, that's what we have left over. And God's rhythm is different. Remember, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the day. He created the night. But remember, night came first. And so we need to get into this rhythm of rest. We need to stop trying to make so many bricks. We talked about the, the Israelites when they were in Egypt. And they were, they were only as good as, as many bricks as they made for the day. And how we all the time are trying to make bricks so we can look better, be better. And so this message, this series that we're going to start in Romans chapter 12, this series I had put together towards the beginning of the fall last year, but I really wasn't sure when God was going to have us do it. In fact, this was going to be the New Year's message. I was going to go through Romans 12 at the beginning of the year, and then the Lord took me in a di different direction. And, and, I'm, and I'm a planner, and so like when I'm in the dark about where we're going to be at in the next two or three months as far as teaching, I get a little bit nervous. And so I knew that we were doing patterns and habits. Refresh just came out of nowhere. And then it was like, okay, God, what do you want to do? We're getting closer to Easter. I already know what we're doing for Palm Sunday and Easter. And the Lord said, now is the time to teach Romans 12. Because we've been talking about patterns and habits. And what we're going to talk about this morning in these first two verses of Romans chapter 12, it has to do with change. And that's a word we don't like. We like to be in, entrenched in what we in our theology. We like to be entrenched in our mornings and how we start our morning and how we go throughout the day. And we do not like change, but God says, I'm a transforming God. And so we're going to talk about that. So the series title is called, is called Rise and Stand Firm. And the reason that I titled it this way is because when we change our patterns of what we're doing and our behaviors of what we're doing, we need to stand firm in that change and, and not go back because we have the tendency to drift back, to float back to what we were doing before. And it's important as we start this study this morning to remember that God ultimately is the one who gives us the strength to change and to stay on course. But as with everything, there's God's part and our part. It's always been like that. When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them their part. Have dominion. Take care of the earth. Right? They had their part. Let me start out by saying this. What if I told you that change doesn't start in the heart, but rather change starts in the mind? Would you agree with that? That change doesn't start in the heart, change starts in the mind. I know a lot of people out there will be like, man, Pastor, that's that psychobabble stuff, man. That's that mental health garbage and all that stuff, psychology and stuff. Let me tell you something. Psychology, the more I've studied psychology, the more I realize they're just taking biblical truths and applying it in a secular way. Right? It's the truth. God created our minds. So why are we so afraid to talk about our mind? But change doesn't start in the heart. It starts in the mind. And that's why today's title is called Transformed, because we're going to be talking about how we transform ourselves in the mind. So, Father, bless us with your presence this morning. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to teach us. And it's your name we pray, Jesus. And all the church said? Amen. So Romans chapter 12 comes after what? Romans chapter 11, right? But you have to understand that Paul, in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, has been talking about Israel is going to be saved. It's going to be saved. Dispelling the notion that the church has replaced Israel. There's people that teach that the church has replaced Israel. It has not. As we saw in our study of Romans a few months back, or well, maybe about a year ago, I guess it was, when we were in 9, 10, and 11, um, we saw the fact that Israel will be saved, that the church is an instrument in God's hand today to make Israel jealous. Paul's words, not mine, right? The church is serving its purpose, but it's always been about the nation of Israel. We have our purpose. We're going to play out our role, 
But in the end, it's going to come back to the nation of Israel. I know that doesn't set well with a lot of people. We like to think that we're the predominant thing. We are for this moment. We are for this moment. And so he's talked about Israel being saved in 9, 10, and 11. And then before that, in the first seven chapters of Romans, he's addressing this conflict that's within us over our sin nature. So he talks about sin and, and, and the law and all these other types of things, and he brings us to the reality that, you know what, we, we live in a, a sinful world, we have a sinful nature, right? And because of that, the, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, especially in Romans, is when Paul says, you know, I, I do what I don't want to do, and, I, and the, what I don't want to do, I do. It's that conflict that we have. But as he's building this case on sin, he's building it towards this redemptive power in Christ. And he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, he says, what a wretched man I am. I mean, I can relate to that. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's it. That's the key right there. We're wretched. We're a mess. But Jesus came to rescue us. And then Paul says in the first verse of, of Romans 8, 1, he says, because of this, because of what Jesus has done, and if we belong to Jesus, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation, man. And then Romans 8 is one of the most beautiful doctrines about how we can never be separated from God. Listen, if you belong to Jesus, I don't care what you do, you cannot be separated from God. We're going to do stupid things, we're going to make mistakes, we're, we might make some huge mistakes. But Paul says in the end of Romans chapter 8, he says, listen, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he goes through a list of things. And so now, as we come to Romans chapter 12, Paul is going to pull all of this together. And he's going to pin out what it looks like to be the complete person in Christ. And so if you open your Bibles, your tablets to Romans chapter 12, we'll start in verse 1. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, Verse 1 is probably one of the most popular passages of Scripture in the Bible, and it's because it talks about this living sacrifice. And we hear it all the time, oh, I'm to be a living sacrifice to God. I'm to be a living sacrifice to God. And it gets a lot of attention. But if you understand how Paul writes at different times, Paul will give us the solution, or rather he'll give us the result and then he'll tell you what the remedy is that you need to do or what you need to do to get to that. And this is what he does here. Because in reality, verse 2 is, is the reality that we need to look at in being a living sacrifice to God. Verse 2 is the key to that. Verse 2 shows us how we can have a transformational change that is real, eternal, and everlasting. And so what I want to do is I want to address the transformed mind first, then what a living sacrifice is, followed that by doing the will of God. If you go to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, it says something interesting. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So, the writer here, which is Solomon, he says that for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. So what does as he think in his heart mean? Well, let me give you an example. You can have two people who have identical experiences 
and go through the same circumstance. But they come out with very different identities. Let's say you go through this very this t- horrific time in your life, and one person, or let's say two people do it, one comes out on the other end, and they say, man, I'm a victim. Bad things always happen to me. Nothing good ever happens to me. God doesn't love me. Woe is me. The other person comes out and says, I'm an overcomer. No matter what life throws at me, I kick it in the tail, and I keep moving forward. Why the difference? Because as one thinks, so he is, and so you are. Your character and everything is based on what you think, and it shapes our thoughts about ourselves and others. Think about it. What we think is a reflection of who we are, right? How do I know that? By the way I see people dress, by the way I dress, by what you do, by how you talk. How you see yourself, what you think, is a reflection of who you are. And here's what you need to understand, church. We have no choice but to live out who we think we are, right? When we're thinking about how we look at ourselves. We make decisions based on our self-identification. We've been doing this for thousands of years. And so let me ask you this morning, how do you identify yourself? How do you identify yourself? Well, most of you would identify yourself as a Christ believer, right? You came into a relationship with Jesus. You love God. You know, Jesus is the, the centrality of my life. Well, think about it. Every single Christ believer, every single Christian experienced the same conversion. Now, you may have come to Jesus through different circumstances, but the moment in time when you encountered Christ, that moment in time when Jesus came into your life, when Jesus took control over your life, it's the same for everybody. The experience is the same. The conversion is the same. The Holy Spirit comes. It seals us. I belong to Jesus. And And so that moment in time is the same for all of us. However, however, although we all come from that same conversion, that same moment in time experience, we all have different outcomes. All of us do. Our identities are different. Some people, they're transformed. Man, They're separated to God. They're on fire for Jesus. Nothing's going to stop them. No circumstance stops them. They're walking out. They're running it out. They're doing everything they can for Christ, man. They have setbacks. They have affliction. They have all these things happen, and they just keep running forward. Others, they remain untransformed. There's no transformation. They've been sealed. They've been separated to God, but there is no transformational process in their hearts or in their minds, and they continue to think carnal. Which is why Paul writes verse 2, to help us understand this point. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Church, our minds must be renewed. Not our hearts, that will come. But the mind has to be renewed. In other words, Paul is saying here, do not adhere to the customs and behaviors of the world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It's so key. It's so key. You must change the way you think. And Paul says, you'll experience transformation transformation, not by changing what you do, but by changing what you think. See, a lot of people think, well, if I just do this, my life's going to be better. If I just do that, my life's going to be better. But what happens is, you might be changing your actions, but you're not really changing your thinking or your behavior. And so what happens is, is, We start thinking, well, if I just eat better, I'm going to lose weight. Well, that's true. But do you have a plan? It it, it has to be more than just eating better. What are you going to do to lose that weight? Are you going to exercise? Right? Are you going to have a workout plan? 
What are you going to do? And so Paul's saying that we must change what we think. You do what you do, church, because of what you think of you. You do what you do because of what you think with you. And you cannot live your life as a living sacrifice unless your mind is renewed. You cannot. It's absolutely impossible. Why? Because the carnal mind, the mind that's entrenched in self and the world, cannot possibly live as a sacrifice to God. Right? The mind must be transformed. It has to be transformed, church. And some of you keep, you're on this, this hamster wheel, and it just keeps spinning and spinning, and you never understand why your life isn't getting better. Why isn't God doing more in my life? Why aren't more things happening in my life? It's because you refuse to transform your thinking, to renew your thinking. Now, a lot of you this morning are saying, well, I don't want to be conformed to this world, Pastor. I don't want that. I want to be transformed. Well, how do I do it? How? How do I transform myself? How do I transform my thinking? Well, let me start with this. The problem with many Christians is they live life based on feelings or they are only concerned about doing. Remember a few weeks back, we talked about instead of do, it's who. It's not, it's not doing things or it's not changing things or how should I say it? It's not doing things that change us. It's recognizing who we want to be to change us. We want to be Christ-like. We want to be Christ followers. And so most people are concerned with doing, and they're, they're, they're concerned with that based on how they feel. How they feel. The life based on feelings is not a good life. It's not. The life based on feelings says this. How do I feel today? Everything's based on how I feel. How do I feel about my job today? Right? Do I, how do I feel? Do I, do, I, do I feel irritated with my boss? You know, do I have a coworker that's getting under my nerves? Uh, do, do, I, do I have too much of a workload? How do I feel about my job today? How do I feel about my wife today? Was my wife mean to me the other day? Did, did my wife not cook me dinner or do whatever I thought she was supposed to do? Uh, how do I feel about worship? You know, worship sucked today. Pastor, man, you, got, you were terrible. You were up there. You couldn't sing and all that, you know. Oh, I don't know how I feel about worship. How do you feel about the preacher, man? We're so stuck in how we feel. My goodness. This life by feeling will never know the transforming power of God because it ignores the renewing of the mind. In other words, the life led by feelings cannot be transformed because your feelings never let you move forward. It's always about your feelings. It's always about how I feel. So when you're, how you feel that day is, is dependent upon a lot of circumstances. And that's a dangerous way to live. Basing your life on how you feel? I'm very careful with people that are always telling me how they feel. Now, I'm not saying that if you're hurting or you need prayer or whatever, but man, when everything is about I feel this and I feel that, let me tell you something. Those people, they are motivated by self. That's what they're motivated by. Their minds are not transformed and renewed, and self keeps holding them back. Self keeps holding you back. Why? Because it's all about you. It's all about how you feel about everything. That's a dangerous way for us to live, church. We can't live in that way. So you have the life of feelings, or you have those who have the life of doings, right? Listen here, pastor. Don't give me no theology just tell me what to do. Give me my four points and 11 different ways of doing things, and I'll be fine. Just show me what I need to do. Well, this life of doing, church, will never know the transforming power of God because it ignores the renewing of the mind. It ignores it. Why? Because it's not about transforming how you think. It's about you doing things and thinking that you can do these things and, and be a sacrifice to God, that you can work your way to heaven, and it doesn't work. 
Now, to be clear, God is not against the principles of feeling and doing. He's not against those principles. Because God is a God of passion, and he's a God of feelings. We see that in the Bible. And he does command us to be doers. But we need to understand what Paul is saying here. Remember, if you go to James chapter 2, verse 17, James says something interesting. He says, in the same way, faith by itself, it, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead, right? Well, what he's saying here is that y- your faith just can't be what you operate on. You've got to put your faith into action. That's how people know that you love Jesus, by what you're doing, right? Feeding the poor, helping people out doing those types of things. And faith always comes first before works. It always comes first. But listen, here's what I need to drive home to you this morning. Faith is not a feeling. It is not a feeling. Faith is a knowledge. Faith is not a feeling, man. Because there's some days where I just don't feel like I have any faith. But I know in my mind that God is on the throne. And that although I may not be there, God is. God's there. And God's going to sustain me. God's going to bring me through. God is going to do the work. So faith is not a feeling, it's a knowledge. And here's what you need to understand. Feelings and doing are completely insufficient foundations for the Christian life. Those cannot be foundations. They can't. And too many of us put everything into feelings. Oh, I have a peace about this. Well, you better understand what Jesus was saying about that type of a peace. Most of the time we don't understand what Jesus was saying in that peace. But you need to go back and you need to reread it. And go read it in the original language and it'll blow your mind what it means. <laughs> feelings and doing are completely insufficient foundations for us as Christians. And we need to understand that. And so when we're put into situations, when we're, we have things before us that we're not sure of, the first question in it cannot be, how do I feel? Or what do I do? Rather, the first question must be, what is true? And what does God's word say? Do you believe the promises of God for you this morning? Do you believe the promises of God? Have you ever looked? Just, just do a Google search. You, you Google search everything else. Google search, search the promises of God. And watch how many promises come up. Those promises are for us. They're for us, church. They're for us. And so what we need to do is we need to stand on the truth of who God is and the truth of what his word says. Not on how I feel about a situation. Because as Darth Vader said to Luke one time, Luke, your feelings betray you, right? Your feelings can betray you. As much as a lot of you think that your feelings are always right on, trust me, there's so many times when I go, okay, that's what you think. Watch what happens. Church, we must transform our minds. We must transform our minds. Now, real quickly, this word transform, just so you can get a better idea of what Paul's saying here. It's a Greek word called metamorpho. And it describes a metamorphosis. In other words, what happens to a caterpillar When it changes into a butterfly, it goes into the cocoon. And when it comes out, it's just beautiful butterfly. So that's the type of change that God is talking about through Paul when he writes being transformed in your mind. Your mind needs to be transformed in that way. You once were this, but now you are that. And it's the same word that's used to describe Jesus and his transfiguration. The same word here, metamorpho, is the same word that was used by the Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 9, when the disciples saw Jesus transformed with Elijah and with Moses. 
It was a glorious transformation. And that's what God envisions for us. This glorious transformation. This transformation in our minds that then sinks into our hearts. There's only one other time Paul uses this word, and it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. For Paul, the transformation and renewing of our minds takes place when we behold the face of God. What does that mean? Spending time with God, looking to who God is, spending time in His glory. When we do that, then we're transformed. Don't think you're going to be transformed if you're watching ESPN all the time or the news all the time or being on social media all the time. Well, you'll be transformed. You'll be transformed into whatever they're doing, right? You're not going to, you're not going to get there. You're going to get there when you spend time with God, when you spend time in the Word, when you spend time in prayer, right? When you spend time listening to worship, when you spend time in church with your brothers and sisters in Christ, that's when it's going to happen. And so this transformation, this renewing of the mind, this must happen first. And then this brings us back to verse 1 of chapter 12. When Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The renewed mind sees God's mercy, understands it's God's mercy, that it's his mercy that has been poured into our lives and allows us to be transformed and renewed. And and then it says that in a sense, Paul is begging his brothers and sisters, right? He's begging them to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice. He's saying, look, I urge you, I beg you to do this because this is so important. Because when you do this, something magnificent, something great is going to happen in your life. Now, the idea of presenting your body as a living sacrifice is rooted in priestly duties. If you remember the priest in the Old Testament, he would go into the uh, holies of holies and he would offer the blood on the altar. Or they would be outside the holies of holies and they would offer the animal sacrificed on the altar. But the idea is presenting or bringing this sacrifice to God, placing it in God's hands. So spiritually speaking, church, our bodies are brought to God's altar. And so when we give the body to God, our spirit, our soul go with it. The whole person, the whole being is given to God. We're saying, God, here I am. Take all of me, not some of me, take all of me. I want you to have every piece of my body, my heart, my mind, my soul. It belongs to you. And so here's what I want you to understand is that when we present our bodies to Christ, or rather to God on the altar, it's because God wants us to. God wants us. God wants us. He wants our being. He wants all of us. He doesn't want your work. A lot of times we think, oh, if I do this, God's going to accept me. Well, if you remember in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul does something stupid outside of God's will. And Samuel comes to him and says, hey, obedience is better than sacrifice. All these things you think you're doing for God mean nothing. Church, God doesn't just want our work. God wants us. We're not coming to God with what we've done. Like, how many bricks have I made for you today, Lord? That's not what we're doing. We're coming and saying, Lord, I'm yours. Do as you please. Where you lead, I will follow. And any brick that's made were produced with your power and might behind it. This is important that you catch what I'm going to say here. You may do all kinds of work for God, but never give him yourself. You may do all kinds of work for God, but you never give him you. You do a lot. You got your checkoff list. 
You're known in the Christian circle as, hey, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a dope, you know, yeah, that, that person. But you never give God you. And see, when we give ourselves, church, we're setting ourselves apart from the world. And that is why Paul says that we're to be holy and pleasing. Remember, holy means set apart. It means we've set ourselves apart. And so when we're offering our bodies to God, we're setting ourselves apart from the world. We're giving ourselves, we're offering our lives to him, and we're saying, God, have your good pleasure with us. How many of you this morning truly desire to offer yourselves up to God? I mean, really wholeheartedly. It's like, you know what, Lord? I'm I'm tired of living the life I'm living. I'm tired of being on this hamster wheel. I'm tired of having the same failures. I'm I'm tired of, of just going through the same routine How many of you really, truly desire to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice? See, the difference is in the Old Testament, the sacrifice was dead. But here Paul says, no, you need to be a living sacrifice. You need to be something that's alive and breathing, that's placed on the altar so that God can have his way with you. I'm hesitant to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, Don't think you'll know God's will in your life unless you've been surrendered. Don't think you'll ever know God's will in your life if you've never had your mind transformed and renewed, because you won't. It's It's impossible. You can't. Because your mind is carnal. Your mind is about the world. Some of you right now are thinking about, man, Pastor's going a little long this morning. I wish he'd hurry up because I've got this to do today and I've got that to do today. I need to get myself moving today, you know? We're so consumed with what's going on with this world. And Jesus said, why? Why are you consumed with it? What I have for you is so much better. It's so much better. And you're running yourselves ragged, chasing after something that makes no sense. Unless you renew your mind, you're going to be in a constant battle. Now, I'm not saying that when your mind's renewed that you don't have battles, that you don't have things that come against you or situations that arise. But what I'm talking about is that constant battle where you're always falling short, right? You're you're constantly in the same rut. You're constantly reliving the same thing you relived one year ago or two years ago or five years ago, right? And then when when it happens, you start blaming the enemy. Oh, Satan, he's after me. Satan, it's not Satan. It's like I had a friend of mine, I don't know if I told you about this, I had a friend of mine that called me one day. He was so mad. He's like, yeah, man, I did this event. Oh, my gosh, I'm so upset, man. He goes, I lost my keys, man. I couldn't find him anywhere. He goes, man, Satan is really working against me. I said, Satan? I said, you're the one who lost your keys. What does that have to do with Satan? How did Satan lose your keys? That was you. You set them down, and you don't remember where you put them. But man, you're, you're blaming the enemy or you're blaming other people. Oh, the only reason this is happening is because it's that person's fault. They did this to me. That, the fact is, it's you. It's you because you refuse to renew your mind and you refuse to <clears throat> lay your life down for Christ as a living sacrifice. And that's why you go through what you go through. The rest of Romans chapter 12 if you cannot get first these, past these first two verses in your heart and your mind, the rest of Romans chapter 12 is going to mean nothing to you. 
Because it all starts with changing how you're thinking, changing how you look at yourself, and giving your life as a living sacrifice to God. I'm gonna, I want to end with J.P. Phillips. He's a theologian. He had an outstanding and memorable translation of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And they were just super cool. It's just I love the way uh, he wrote this out. He says, with wide, eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. I love what he says, intelligent worship. Some people are fools when they worship. He says, do not let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. Church, that's what God wants. He wants us to move towards true maturity. Some of you have been infants for years. And it's time to grow up. Paul says, man, I can't, I can't give you meat because you can't get off the darn bottle. I got to keep giving you milk all the time because you don't want to grow. Church, it's clear that the world wants to squeeze us out, but God has something better. I implore you today to go home and reread Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and ask God to renew your mind and show you what it is to be a living sacrifice so that then and only then can you understand the perfect will of God. God wants you, but you got to meet him where he's at. Thank you, Lord, for this day and this word. Um, thank you, Father, for just loving us and taking care of us, God. And uh, We're so in awe of you, Lord. And Lord, we, we, just, we just desperately want to please you. And it's not easy, Lord, in the world that we live in. We're thankful for our lives, Lord. We're thankful for our, our country, our homes, our jobs. and We know that those, those things have come from your hand, God, but they should never be the priority. My allegiance is to the kingdom of God. My allegiance isn't to anything here on earth. And I know that's the same for my brothers and sisters, that that's how... They want to live their lives because your kingdom is going to come, Lord, and, and the nations of the world are going to bow their knee. Go before us this day, God. Heal all those who are sick, Lord. Continue to heal me and Mama Bear and get us on the up and up, Lord. And uh, thank you, Father, for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>